Okay, so far we have talked about three-phase power development. We kind of talked about in the previous video about how we develop the three-phase power, where it comes from, uh, how it is that it magically comes out of the wall three phases. We talked about how it's all developed and generated. So now we want to be able to take the three phases of voltage and apply it to a three-phase motor. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, this is the symbol for three-phase motor. Okay. One uh, thing that I want to bring to your attention, when you are going to be asked at some point uh, throughout this class to design some motor control circuits, uh, and I want them to be done on a professional level. I don't mean by buying software or anything like that. What I'm talking about is when you draw something uh, for an assignment, I want it done very neatly and, and on a professional level. Use a ruler, just to, you can just use a basic simple ruler uh, to draw straight lines. What I don't want is a bunch of freehanding uh, lines drawn across a piece of paper and everything. Uh, make it as legible as possible, as professionally clean and as neat as uh, possible. Do, the, do your best work on that one, okay? But anyway, <clears throat> this, is the, this is the symbol for a three-phase motor. And you'll remember from our previous video or lecture, we had three dark lines that were feeding the three phases of voltage, L1, L2, and L3, to our motor, okay? So, um, we also talked just briefly about the advantages of an AC induction motor, okay? Squirrel cage motors, what we'll call these. Uh, they have more uh, torque, particularly at startup. Uh, they take up less physical space. Uh, if this were a 10 horsepower um, three-phase motor, then a 10 horsepower single-phase motor would be much large in physical size, okay? So a three-phase motor is smaller for the same amount of horsepower, and also they are typically lighter in weight, all right? And this is a biggie right here. Um, they are less maintenance than a DC motor. It used to be that the only way to vary the speed of a motor was be, would be to have a DC motor. You would, you would adjust the field voltage and it would adjust the RPM of the motor. Uh, and you couldn't do that with AC. Well, that's changed now. Uh, <clears throat> but, and now that that's changed, we have, uh, this is a lot less maintenance than a DC motor. Over here in this picture, you'll see, it looks similar to a three-phase induction motor, but right here you're looking at um, a commutator and brushes and, uh, and, and brush holders and things like that. These are all wear components in a DC motor that you don't have with an AC motor. And anytime you can remove something that's gonna wear or cause you a point of failure, it's always best to get rid of it. So uh, D a DC motors, have, they're still around, there's a lot of them still around, uh, but they've been phased out so much uh, with the AC motors now that we can vary the speed of an AC motor with the advent of the variable frequency drive that came about uh, in the late 80s, so, uh, roughly. So now with that invention, we can vary the AC motor, still have that strong startup torque, but with a lot less maintenance, a lot more components, a lot fewer components uh, to fail, okay? Uh, and also, they have no starting aids required, and uh, we mentioned that earlier uh, about having the, uh, the uh, centrifugal switches, the, uh, the additional windings, the capacitors, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> single phase, uh, are, most single phase motors are fractional in horsepower. They usually run about 120 or 240 volts. You see a lot of these in your home, okay, your washing machine, your dryer, things like that. Uh, they, uh, the AC induction motor is self-starting. Again, we don't need starting aids such as capacitors and additional start windings and, and things like that. And the, these are just, again, potential uh, points of failure. They're gonna make something fail. Now, I've got this uh, picture of this dryer, a clothes dryer. If you have an older clothes dryer, um, uh, it has a single phase motor on there and uh, when you open the door a lot of times you hear uh, after about two or three seconds as the drum is spooling down you hear a click okay well, that click is a centrifugal switch that is opening I'm assuming it's closing all right and uh, a lot of times you can open the door the door of the dryer while it's still turning throw something in there and close the door right back and it'll take off and continue to run however if it takes too long and, you, and it spools down enough and you hear that click of the centrifugal switch you have to go back and hit the start button and start all over. I just put this up there because I thought it's kind of, you find, might find it very, uh, a little bit interesting. Um, you know, you've got a centrifugal switch that's closed when the, when the dryer is dead still, okay? We hit that start button and the rotor begins to spin. And as the faster that rotor spins, and this all happens very, very quickly, but the faster it spins, it will eventually throw up a centrifugal switch. But while it's still uh, t uh, sitting still and just starting to turn, this centrifugal switch brings in a set of start windings. That adds additional torque. Okay, to get that drum turning full of wet clothes, it adds additional torque, 
and it lets the motor start running. And as soon as the rotor gets spinning fast enough on that switch on that uh, uh, motor, it will throw open a centrifugal switch. The start windings are no longer in play. It takes them completely out of circuit, and you run on two windings here, one or one set of windings, I should say, uh, one set of windings, and it makes the motor run a lot faster. But we have to have some help to get us going. Well, that's not the case with a three-phase motor. Uh, that's one of the, as I said earlier, that's one of the advantages. We have no starting age, and we have a lot of uh, starting torque right out of the gate. Okay. Now, what I've got here is three phases of voltage uh, depicted here with these sine waves. Okay. And you'll notice here that the uh, arrow is the, the indicating the rotor. Okay. It is aligned with this these set of green coils, the positive and negative of the green coils. Well, you'll notice that the green and the negative is peaking at this point, so it's going to align itself with the, with the strongest magnetic field. Well, this one's peaking the most, so it is the strongest magnetic field, so the rotor wants to shift itself and align itself with that set of coils. Well, as three phase starts to drop off, another phase will start to pick up, and so in this particular case, the blue phase is peaking 90 degrees past the peak of the green phase. So 90 degrees later, uh, we have a peak coming in on, on the second phase, and the, the, uh, the blue coils are going to be the stronger magnetic field. So the rotor is going to chase the strongest magnetic field. It's the next one over here. So it's starting to rotate. All right? And as the B phase starts to phase off, fade off, okay, we'll see that the negative is starting to peak 90 degrees past that. All right? And so here we have the motor shifting again because now the red phase, in this case the third phase, is uh, providing the strongest voltage to the coils right here. So it's, the rotor is naturally attracted to the strongest one. So what you're seeing is a rotating magnetic field going around like this. This is very important. You'll hear this a lot. The motor is, uh, has a rotating magnetic field. Well, the, uh, the rotor of, or the armature of that motor is wanting to chase that magnetic field. So as that magnetic field is going around and around like this, that rotor is just chasing. And you can see we break it down into um, uh, six different or six or seven different um, phases or stages, I should say. I don't want to use the word phases. That's very important. So, so what we've done is we step by step. You'll notice that the rotor is continuing to turn in a clockwise direction. So what it's doing is it's chasing the strongest magnetic field at that moment in time. In this case, the strongest magnetic field is the green one. It's peaking down here in the negative side. Okay. In this case, the strongest magnetic field is the blue one, peaking 90 degrees later. So it's basically all that rotor is doing is sitting on a set of bearings, spinning freely. You can take the shaft and spin it on you freely. You apply power, that, mag that rotating magnetic field is going around and around, and the rotor is just chasing that magnetic field. I got a, a motor right here out of, the, um, out of the lab, and you're going to see this. And this is basically what we've got. We, we hook our three-phase voltage to our windings, and we're going to talk about windings here in just a minute. But you take the three-phase voltage, and you connect your windings, and that magnetic field is going around and around like this. Well, we have the rotor that's sitting on a set of bearings, and it's wanting to chase the magnetic field, like so. Okay. And that's all it's doing is chasing, chasing a magnetic field around and around, okay? And that's the simple operation of the three-phase motor, okay? Now, there's a little, there's a little uh, interactive graphic here. Uh, as you can see, we're going to peak right here with our red, right there, and it aligns with the red. It's going to peak right here with the green, align with this green. It's going to peak with the blue, and it's going to align with the blue. Why? Because these are the strongest magnetic fields. At this point right here, so this set of coils right here is the most strongest. So it's going to align itself. It's just chasing a rotating magnetic field. So when you hear that rotating magnetic field, that's what we're talking about. And the rotor, which is another magnet, which is the opposites attract, that is just simply chasing it around in a circle. Okay? And that's how we get our, our motion for the rotor. Okay? So what determines the speed of our AC motor? All right, there's two factors involved. There's the number of poles in the motor. And there's also the frequency that we apply to the motor. The frequency is being delivered from the power plant. Okay, we talked about being uh, in the United States 60 hertz. Okay, that's one of the, that's one of the two factors involved in determining the speed of the motor. Okay, so again, 
uh, th one other thing that, uh, uh, that when we talk about the number of poles, okay, the fewer the poles, the faster the motor, okay, the faster the RPM of the rotor, all right. If we add poles, we get additional torque, it's good and strong, but we also slow the speed of the motor down. So fewer poles means greater speed and less torque, and more poles mean less speed and greater torque, okay. So let's take a look at this right now. Right now, <clears throat> This is a uh, two-pole motor, all right? What we mean, it looks at, if you look at it, it looks like, well, wait a minute, Mike, this is a six-pole motor. No, it's not. It's uh, each winding, uh, or each phase has uh, windings around the two different poles, okay? So that's how we come up with, with the two-pole, all right? So there's two poles here, two poles here, and two poles here for this uh, three-phase motor. So um, there's a, you can figure this out mathematically, by taking um, the determine the RPM by taking 120, which is a fixed number, and we multiply that by the frequency. Well, what's the frequency? We, we already said that it was 60 hertz. Okay, here in the U.S. All right, so we multiply 120 times 60, and you divide that by the number of poles. And in this position, in this picture right here that we looked at, we said this was a two-pole motor. So we divide um, the 120 times 60 by the two poles. And we come up and we can theoretically say that this motor will turn at 3,600 RPMs. Notice I said the word theoretically. We're going to get into a reason why I said that in just a minute. Okay? So, <clears throat> if we take this and we've got a four pole motor, and let's take a look at this. You got a pole here, a pole here, and a pole here, all for the A phase. I don't know how well you can see this on the screen, but this red is the A phase. Okay, this is A1 and A2. So we've got four poles for this motor, um, for each phase, so it's a four pole motor. So again, we take our math and we look at 120 times our 60, the frequency did not change from the power plant, okay? So it's still 60 times, I mean, divided by the number of poles, which is four, and now we're running at 1800 RPMs. Notice this, we doubled the number of poles and we, and we uh, split the RPMs in half, okay? We put four poles instead of two, and now we've got 1800 RPMs might want to pay attention to that because you're going to see that a little bit later, okay? Uh, and besides the lecture, you might see that on the quiz, but make sure you kind of got this down. You need to stop the video, go, by all means, go ahead, okay? Now, let's suppose, let's look at this one. This is a six pole. We have A1 and A2, A1 and A2, A1 and A2. So we have six poles for the A phase. We'll take a look at the B phase while we're at it, too. There's one, two, three, four, five, and six. So <clears throat> there are six poles per phase, so we call this a six pole motor. So we have 120, which is our fixed value. The frequency has not changed from Big Rivers or TVA or anywhere else, it's 60 hertz. And we divide it by the number of poles. Now we have a six pole motor. We're gonna make it turn even slower, okay? 1200 RPM is the, is the speed, theoretically, okay? Again, theoretically. Why do I say theoretically? Well, first of all, you've got two speeds going on in this motor. Number one is the speed of the rotating magnetic field, all right? <clears throat> and then we have the actual speed of the rotor itself. Those two do not match. They are not both 1,800 RPMs in, this, in that, the previous example, for example. Uh, 1,800 RPMs is your, your ma rotating magnetic field. The rotor does not quite catch up to it. reason being is we, have, we induce a voltage anytime there is relative motion between uh, the magnet and the rotor, okay? If the rotor and the magnetic field were in the exact same speed, we'd have no motion because there's no, you gotta have relative uh, motion between the two. And if you have none, you have no rotation. So the voltage induced in the rotor is a result of the relative motion between the rotor and the rotating magnetic field, all right? So we wind up with 1800 RPM mag, uh, rotating magnetic field and the actual speed of the rotor. The difference between those two is known as slip or motor slip, okay? Now we can figure that out, it's really quite simple. Um, the slip is the synchronous speed, the difference between the synchronous speed and the actual speed. So just do some simple math, you got 1800 RPMs is your rotating magnetic field. Your rotor, uh, which has a counter EMF in it, it's running at 1725 RPM. So the difference is going to be a 75 RPM slip. A big deal, okay? What we want to do too is, is determine the percent of slip in that motor, okay? So we, 
it's another fairly simple mathematical calculation. You take the synchronous speed and you subtract the actual speed and then you divide that by your synchronous speed and multiply it by 100 and that gives you a percentage, okay? In this case, if we have an 1800 RPM rotating magnetic field in the windings of our motor and we have a 1725 actual speed uh, of our rotor in the motor, which is slower than the, the uh, synchronous speed, then we have a difference of 75, which we, we saw just a minute ago. All right, we divide that by our synchronous speed, which we stated was 1800 RPM, and multiply that by 100, and we come up with 4.1% slip, okay? So that's how you calculate, we have a 4.1% slip. Now, in the lab, you're gonna be asked to um, put a, uh, um, a uh, strobe light on the shaft of a motor. You're, you're gonna be asked to, to uh, point it at the shaft of the motor and look at a piece of reflective tape and you'll dial in and see exactly how fast the motor shaft is actually turning. Okay, you'll notice it's not going to be 1800 RPM. Okay, that's the rotating magnetic field, but the actual shaft speed is going to be somewhere probably around seven, probably about 750, 1750, 1760, somewhere in that neighborhood there. But that will be your actual shaft speed and you'll be asked to calculate the, uh, the slip and its percentage as well. So that's how that's done. Now, we also said that not only is the number of poles uh, uh, one of the contributing factors to our speed, but also the frequency of the power. Now, <clears throat> we really can't change the incoming power uh, too much uh, unless we use a variable frequency drive. But I want to show you this mathematically on how fast a two-pole AC motor running at 60 hertz will, okay? It's pretty simple math as well. Your, 100, your RPM is equal to your 120, which is constant. Multiply that by your frequency, and you divide that by the number of poles. It's the same uh, formula as before, only now we're changing the frequency, okay? So if we have a frequency <coughs> of, uh, say, 60 hertz, and we have a two-pole motor, then we've got 3,600 RPMs. We've worked that one before, and again, theoretically, all right? Now, let's change the frequency. Same motor, but we're gonna change the frequency. Let's say we're able to change it from 60 hertz to 30, okay? Just do the math, 120 times 30 times the same number of poles, and now we've got an 1800 RPM motor. Uh, remember, when we were running at um, 60 hertz, that two pole motor ran at 3600 RPMs. Well, we've cut our frequency in half, this number right here, so it's gonna cut our RPM in half. And again, that's theoretically because as we just stated, our shaft, our rotor shaft, is not going to spin the same speed as the um, synchronous speed of the magnetic field. So again, uh, another example, now we've got a four pole motor running at 30 hertz, okay, 120, which is fixed, times the 30 hertz, times the four pole motor. We're going to run that four pole motor at 900 RPM, okay, and again, that's theoretical, okay. Um, I want to show you one more thing about this uh, motor. And <clears throat> Before we, that's before we go into the windings part, okay? All right, we're talking about windings here. Um, these are these are the, these are the windings number one one four and windings number three six and five two seven eight uh, eight nine seven nine. These are all windings. When we say windings, first of all, a winding is simply one piece of wire uh, wrapped in a coil. It's wrapped around a piece of steel, okay? And in this case, when you open your motor up in, in the in the lab. You'll see it wrapped around the, the pole pieces, okay? But they take that one piece of wire, it's no more complex than that, and they wrap it around that piece of iron to create a magnetic field, all right? Well, you have the start of a, of a winding, it's one piece of the end of your wire, wraps around the core, and then comes out the other end of that wire. It's just really that simple. And here are the windings right here, okay? It goes in, for example, uh, winding number uh, one four, I believe, is blue and yellow. The, the winding numbers are marked on the uh, are on the sides of the, of the uh, wires themselves. But winding number one is right here, it goes into here, and it comes out number four. This right here is all looped around. It's loop, looped around these pole pieces, and this is what you see uh, in the schematic. Okay. Uh, but I just want to give you an idea of when we're talking about windings, we're, we're talking about these leads coming out of here. These are all individual leads uh, and this right here. There's nine leads. If you look, there's nine different leads on these windings. This is them right there. It goes in, does its thing around the white, white winding around the poles, and comes back out. How we connect them, that's a different story. That's going to be determining uh, whether it's high voltage or 
whether it's low voltage, if we're going to connect it in a, a Y formation or a delta formation. We'll get into that particularly when you get into lab. But <clears throat> for example, in this Y formation, we will connect, we'll connect wires number four, five, and six together. It basically says that we're going to take this wire and we're going to put a wire nut in this one and this one and this one and tie these three together. Okay, that leaves wire number one out here, wire, uh, winding number two and three. Okay, one, two, and three. And then seven, eight, and nine are, are tied together. So for a low voltage, we're going to tie three, uh, four, five, and six together. We're going to tie one and seven together, which will be uh, one right here and here. We're going to tie two and eight together, which will wire nut two and eight together. And then we're going to wire three and nine, these right here, together. And that will give us the configuration for a low voltage motor. In low voltage in the lab, it's 208 volts. Typically, uh, high voltage is 480 volts and higher. But uh, for our case in the lab, uh, we're going to be winding, we're going to be wiring it in the Y configuration for low voltage. Okay. And if we had high voltage, I'll just go ahead and talk to you about this. If we had high voltage, we would tie four and seven. These two, we just jump with these right here together. Five and eight, and six and nine. Okay. And then that would give us, uh, and we would hook our uh, L1 to terminal to number one, our L2 to number two, and our L3 to number to number three for one and number three. So that's for a high voltage situation. But I just want to kind of give you an idea when we're talking about windings and what's going on inside that motor. I want you to be able to understand it's just simply one piece of wire wrapped around a piece of iron, creates a magnetic field, and when that magnetic field is strongest, that rotor is chasing it, we're going to be attracted to it, and we just continue to put the different phases of voltage on these different windings in that whole circle of the motor. Okay, um, <clears throat> here's another example our low voltage connection, what I kind of just did right here, okay? What we've done is, uh, for the low voltage, we're going to tie one and seven together. Well, you can see there's the end of one, and here's the end of seven, and we've tied it together right there, all right? And we're going to put our voltage right there. Line one's going to, L1's going to go right there. We're going to take two and eight. Here's the end of two, wire number two and number eight. It's the same wires that are coming out, those colored wires that are coming out of the uh, junction box on that motor. And we're going to tie those together and we're going to put line two voltage onto this one. And then <clears throat> three and six are going to be tied together. There's three right here and six. Uh, excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, three and nine. I'm, I'm sorry. Three and nine are tied together right there. Okay. And then you've got four right there. It's tied to six right there. And then over here, it's tied to five. Four, five, and six tied together. So that's how we wire up a three phase voltage. It's going to be very simple to do this on the trainer, but we're going to spend not we're not going to spend as much time on the trainer as you are on a real life panel because that's where I want you to get the real experience. It's easy to plug these things up with the little kitty diagrams that, that come with the trainers. In this class, we're going to spend more time pulling wire and actually wiring these things up because when you walk out of here, you're not going to have these trainers to uh, refer to, or you don't have these trainers that would have the plug and play wires. <clears throat> that's not real world. So in this class, you're going to get a lot more of that. But I just want to give you an idea. Now, these notice that uh, when we wire it like these, like this, these windings are in parallel for our low voltage. Okay, they're in parallel. Now, if we go to high voltage, okay, we're wire, we're wiring them in series. And I'm going to trace these in case you can't see this very well. But notice, to start with T1, and then we to T4, and we hook it to seven, and then and then come out to seven here to the to the end point here inside the motor. All right, and then. We take uh, T3, all right, and we go to six. It comes out six, and then you go to nine, all right. And notice that these are in series. These windings are in series. So it suffices to say that when we were winding, when we were wiring a motor <coughs> for low voltage, we're putting uh, each set of windings, two sets of windings, in parallel. And when we wire it for high voltage, we're putting them in series. Okay. You should remember series and parallel from your. Uh, 1101 class in your 1001 and 1002 classes. So make sure you kind of uh, remember that uh, and brush up on it if need be. So we're set at this point. What we've got, we've got line one, two, and three, and we've got three phases of voltage connected to our three phase motor. Okay, these are our conductors, and this is our symbol for a three phase motor. We should be ready to run. Okay, now. I want to talk a little bit more about schematics because you will be asked to do some uh, designs and things like that of circuits and motor, motor control circuits.
Okay? So a couple of things when you're doing these drawings and when you see these drawings, okay, you'll notice that bold lines depict the three-phase circuit. Okay? Uh, this one that I pulled off, uh, and it is not, uh, is all three-phase, so that you can't really tell the difference between this, but you got three uh, black lines here, three heavy lines that depict the three-phase circuit. Okay? And these solid black dots, I've got the arrows pointing at, those are connection points, meaning that we're connecting a wire off of one of the faces here, and one of the faces here, and one of the faces here. And we're going into circuit breakers and overloads and things like that on down to the motor. But uh, we're going to get into that in your next lesson. But right now, I want you to know that the, that the lines uh, represent conductors, straight lines. The thicker black lines are usually your um, power or motor circuit. Okay, same thing, power or motor. You can use those uh, words interchangeably. Um, and your control circuit, which we'll get into later on in this class, is usually a lighter colored line. Okay, but the black dots indicate that there's a connection. In other words, these three, these three wires, these three conductors are connected at this point. This one's connected here, this one's connected here to phase two, and this one's connected to phase three, and then it feeds the circuit further on down. But I want you to get uh, comfortable with making uh, good diagrams. Again, notice the straight lines here. They're just not like all over the board, okay? And they're not done, done freehand. Please make good uh, schematics and good drawings. Use, just use a simple ruler and use a pencil. That's going to be your best friend because you're inevitably going to make mistakes and it's a lot easier to correct than scribbling out ink or starting all over. Get yourself a good mechanical pencil and a ruler and be able to make these lines and, and, and also if you do make a mistake you can, you can change it. Okay? Uh, one other thing too is that um, when we, this is a connection point, but if we're showing it feeding something else down here, for example, this is a symbol for a transformer, that's lesson number three, we'll get to that. But we connect, we have a connection right here. We're pulling off of phase A, A, a phase right here. We're pulling a wire, and you'll see this little horseshoe jump right here. That means that it's not connected. Um, it helps us, when you're looking at the drawing, it just tells us that is not connect, A is not connected to B or C or the neutral, okay? It's just, a, a, it's just kind of jumping over it just to show us the path it's taken, but there's no connection whatsoever, okay? However, we go through the coil of the transformer and we do reconnect back here to the neutral. All right, again, this one is going to have to jump over two conductors that are not connected. So the horseshoe, it means there's no electrical connection. And finally, this third one here is going into this transformer, and it's only got one to jump over in this illustration. So again, just showing you what the, uh, the horseshoe or the jumps uh, uh, give you, uh, what they mean in the schematics, okay? So quickly wrapping up for this, uh, this kind of re recap. Uh, we, got, we, we talked about how three-phase voltage is produced. We said, we, we, we noted why three-phase voltage is used over um, single phase. Interestingly enough, uh, you can have nine or 12 or 16 uh, phases, or 15 phases, excuse me, not 16, 15 phases, in multiples of three, uh, and it's, it's very efficient, very, you know, it's, it's, it gives a better power ripple, cleaner power ripple, however, it's not as cost effective. So. Years ago, they all got together, uh, these, these uh, uh, engineers, and decided the standard should be three-phase, okay? But uh, you just add more magnets uh, in your, and more poles in your generator at the power plant, and you get more phases coming out of it. But they've gone with three phases for our industry standard. Um, we've talked about the advantages of AC motors over DCs. Make sure you know about that. Uh, motor poles, okay, what, what are motor poles, okay? Um, synchronous speed versus actual, okay? You should know how to calculate the uh, motor speed and the slip percentage and also know about your uh, symbols that we've discussed as well, okay? That's going to do it for this lecture right here. Now these lectures are not designed to be the end all and be all of what you need to learn for the lesson, okay? The lectures are here to enhance it. We, we cover it, we talk about it. It gives me a chance to get in front of the camera and show you some visual demonstrations and things like that. You'll see more as we go through the, uh, through the semester. But uh, use this, take notes. I hope you've been taking notes in this one. Um, you need to take notes in, in the lab and also uh, make some, jot some uh, notes down in your reading and do some highlighting as well. If you have any problems or any questions, by all means, come see me. I'm in my office. I'll be spending a lot of time in the lab this semester as well. So just uh, give me a shout and I'll help you in any way I can. Okay? Good luck and thanks for watching.